Um, so, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's good to see that you're still here. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of what I've been doing over the last 10 years, all of which has been supported by the HRB. So, like my other colleagues, I can definitely say that the HRB have influenced and facilitated my clinical practice and my research practice, so I'm really grateful for that. <clears throat> so, over my next um, 10 to 12 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about how HRB have facilitated facilitated improvements in healthcare in Ireland. So for us clinicians who look after people with diabetes and pregnancy, this is our dream to have a woman and a baby who are satisfied and healthy at the end of pregnancy. But that's not always the case because when a woman has too much sugar or hyperglycemia, <clears throat> she is at risk of having a pregnancy complicated by a baby who has significant congenital malformations, stillbirth, uh, increase in perinatal mortality due to primarily prematurity. And some babies are born very big or fat looking. This is a macrosomic baby, and this is from overnutrition of the baby because of the excess glucose of the mother. The mother herself is at risk of, of pregnancy induced hypertension and preeclampsia. So, diabetes is the most common medical condition in pregnancy. For women with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, it um, accounts for 1 in 250 pregnancies. For women who develop gestational diabetes, that's diabetes that develops within the pregnancy, we now know that this is common at 12%. When we look at the national figures, what does this mean for the Irish mother and infant population? <clears throat> well, at a rate of 60,000 births per year, it means that we have 240 women and their babies affected by type 1 and type 2 diabetes each year. And if you look at a prevalence of 12% for gestational diabetes, that means 7,200 women and their babies are affected each year by this condition. Ideally, this is the outcome of pregnancy we're looking for, a baby that's normal in size for gestational, uh, um, for gestational age and free of congenital malformations. But unfortunately, this is the type of baby we sometimes see. So you can see this baby is rather obese, uh, and, and the obesity is primarily uh, centred on the abdomen. So this baby has a lot of fat in the abdomen. This is metabolically very bad fat, and predisposes this baby to diseases like obesity, prediabetes, diabetes, and heart disease in their adult life. This is the other extreme we see, which is the really small baby due to prematurity or poor intrauterine growth because of the mother's diabetes. <clears throat> and as Louise Kenny has told us, this leads to a lot of morbidity for that baby in the neonatal and ongoing years. And this is the other scenario we see. It's babies born with congenital malformations. So this is caudal regression syndrome. And you can see that the baby has not developed properly from the waist down. This is all very preventable by proper health care. So when I started this program in 2006, there was very little information nationally or regionally on diabetes and pregnancy. So I had a few simple questions that I wanted to answer, and these were they, and this is where HRB came in to help me to answer these questions. Firstly, what was the outcome of pregnancy for women with type 1 and type 2 diabetes? Secondly, what was the current prevalence of gestational diabetes? How did gestational diabetes affect the pregnancy? And after the pregnancy, did the diabetes go away, or was the woman um, at risk of ongoing diabetes? So we set up the Atlantic Diabetes and Pregnancy Programme, a multi-centre uh, uh, cohort study. Um, we included the five antenatal centres delivering healthcare for women with diabetes in our region. We have about 11,000 deliveries annually, and we collect all our data electronically. So our first uh, paper was to examine pregnancy outcomes. I was really disappointed and horrified to see that these were our outcomes. Congenital malformation rates were twice as common in our diabetic ladies. Stillbirth was five times as common. Perinatal mortality was three times as common as women in the region who did not have diabetes. And of, of utter shame to all of us providing care was that 50% of these babies were born macrosomic or large, therefore posing these, these children for future um, health problems as adults. When we looked deeper into it, we weren't surprised really to see that our findings were as bad as this because only about two to three women were properly prepared for pregnancy. Only four out of ten received folic acid, and less than 50 per cent were properly prepared in terms of good glucose control prior to the pregnancy. 
We know, and this has been in the literature for a very long time, that there is a linear relationship between glucose control and adverse outcomes in the mother and in the pregnancy. So the higher your glucose control, the more likely you are to have a poor pregnancy outcome. So what did we do about it? Well, we designed, implemented, and evaluated a pre-pregnancy care programme that we could offer in the region to these women to improve outcomes. What we found was that women who attended this programme were much better prepared for pregnancy, so they were less likely to smoke, uh, they were much more likely to have um, folic acid, almost 100%. We were able to eliminate teratogenic medications, they had a lower BMI at the start of pregnancy and much better sugar control. And this sugar control that was better, as you can see in the dark blue line, for women who attended the service persisted right throughout the pregnancy, and people who didn't come for pre-pregnancy care never actually caught up. Now, this had a significant impact on the outcomes of the pregnancy. So you can see here that any serious adverse event was reduced significantly. We almost eliminated congenital malformations, and we've been able to reduce neonatal unit care by a third. And we went on to work with Health Economics to look at was it cost effective. So to deliver care to women who attend for pre-pregnancy care followed by antenatal care, the cost is about 6,800. For women who don't come for pre-pregnancy care, the cost is much higher at over 10,000. And when we adjust it for all of the other factors that may have influenced this cost, there is a differential of 2,577 euro for each woman. When we looked at why this was the case, the main cost savings were in relation to neonatal unit care and also to the ongoing care of, of um, babies who had congenital malformations. So how has this influenced the lives of these women and children over 10 years? Well, we've just published our 10-year review of our outcomes, and we can now say that we've optimised care for women with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and the outcomes of these pregnancies are now very close to the background population, which is a significant improvement from where we started in 2006. The next thing we looked at was the prevalence of, type, uh, pre prevalence of gestational diabetes. The only one study in the country was in the year 2000 in one hospital in Dublin, identifying the prevalence of GDM at 2.7%. But we all know that our population has changed enormously, and so we wish to establish a, a more true prevalence for gestational diabetes. And we did this by um, delivering universal screening in our SALTA group across five hospital sites. We invited 12,000 uh, odd women to participate, and 5,500 women consented and were screened. Now, at the bottom line, you can see across the five hospital sites, the prevalence of gestational diabetes ranged from 10.8% in Galway to about 14.6% in Letterkenny. But overall, the prevalence was about 12.4%. So that was significantly greater than what was reported in the literature and what our health system was guided towards. My question, however, was, does it matter that you have gestational diabetes? So we looked at how did this influence outcome for the mother? So if you have gestational diabetes, as a mother, you're much more likely to have pregnancy-induced hypertension, preeclampsia, and be delivered by caesarean section. For the baby, you're much more likely to be delivered early, you're more likely to be premature, and I was also very keen at looking at this area of large for gestational age or macrosomic infants, and you can see that these are significantly greater in pregnancies um, that have gestational diabetes, again, uh, again setting up these babies for a lifetime of chronic ill health. So we changed our practice. We implemented uniform screening in the region. Before this, it was all different in, all, in the different hospitals. Everybody was doing their own thing. And we developed a multi-professional service that was delivered in all hospitals, so each woman got good health care regardless of their geographical location. And the question is, has it done any uh, difference? So for women with gestational diabetes, the mainstay of treatment is diet and exercise. It's a low-cost intervention, and this low-cost intervention is successful in achieving the targets in 60% of women. In 40% of women, they also need additional insulin. 
So when we looked at those who were treated with diet only, I was delighted to see that we've now eliminated macrosomia, or large for gestational age size, in women with gestational diabetes compared with normal glucose tolerant women across all the BMI categories, and this is so satisfying. We've also been able to show the same thing for the insulin treated women, but we identified a new problem. In these women, 57% have excessive gestational weight gain, and that excessive weight gain leads to further problems with hypertension and also promotes macrosomia. So that has led us, and supported by HRB again, to design a new randomised control trial to look at a new medication called metformin, which is used routinely in type 2 diabetes care, to see if that can give us good outcomes for gestational diabetes without having excessive weight gain. And myself and Louise Kenny are about to embark on the uh, enrolment into this study, and we're going to have 550 women. Now, once the pregnancy is finished, it would be lovely to say to you that the diabetes is all gone away. So we wanted to follow up the mothers in particular after the pregnancies with GDM to see, did they continue to have diabetes? So this is the horrifying fact at a mean of five years post the uh, index pregnancy with gestational diabetes. Almost 26% of these women continue to have pre-diabetes and diabetes when we compare them to a matched control group of women who did not have diabetes in the index pregnancy. More worryingly, we were able to look at factors that contribute to heart disease. They come under the umbrella of the metabolic syndrome and include waist circumference, blood pressure, and abnormal lipids. And these are all significantly greater or more increased in women who had previous gestational diabetes, as you can see in purple. So where are we now? Well, after 10 years, and that was just an overview of what we've been doing, um, we have taken the answers to our clinical problems and changed the way we deliver healthcare. So we now have a regionalised system of healthcare for these women that offers care before, during and after pregnancy. This has not required any additional staff, no additional money, there's no waiting times, and there's a very low DNA rate to our service. We've shown that it's cost effective, and in all of this development, we have had patient involvement, which has been key to success. The outcomes for women, I'm glad to say, with type 1 and type 2 diabetes in our region are now almost comparable to the background population, which is a significant change. And we have shown that gestational diabetes is very common, but that low-cost interventions are effective um, at changing the outcomes. We've been able to impact um, HSE guidelines for diabetes in pregnancy, European guidelines for diabetes in pregnancy, and we've also received the presidency of the uh, International Association of Diabetes in Pregnancy Study Groups. Through the HRB and the HRB funding and producing our evidence and developing our network, we can now collaborate with peers across Europe uh, and look for funding from Horizon 2020. And also, the inclusion of this data set is now uh, common in many large systematic reviews. I'm glad to see that the HSE have now uh, acknowledged this work, and we've won the SALTA HSE Award for Research in 2015, and the, the, the awards for research publications in these three categories, Health and Wellbeing, Quality Improvement and Clinical Strategy, and this year we've won the Irish Healthcare Awards. But we're not finished yet because there's still lots of unanswered questions which you would expect to find when you answer the first set of questions. So I think the whole area of screening needs to be reviewed uh, to look at whether it's more cost effective and beneficial to the health of the mother and the infant to uh, have universal screening rather than our current selective screening policy which misses 50% of the uh, cases. Also, whether earlier screening and an earlier intervention would give us a better outcome to pregnancy. And of course, longitudinal follow-up of the mother and the infant is really important to see that the intervention that we gave in pregnancy has an impact on the future life of the baby and the mother. Prevention is the holy grail, and we have lots of ongoing work on prevention of GDM and type 2 diabetes afterwards. So these are some of our um, help uh, things that we've done for mothers and for practitioners. 
We also have an active website that we engage um, with people, and we're also on the social um, media, which is really important. So thank you for your attention.